Hey you folks, today we're going to run through an example of a problem that we solve using conservation of angular momentum. Fairly common example for uh, something to think through with this topic, uh, and that's a person riding on a merry-go-round and then changing their position on the merry-go-round and looking at how that affects the motion of the merry-go-round and person system as a whole. So let's get started. Before we solve the problem, let's just recall that the angular momentum, and that would be this L term here, is equal to the rotational inertia of some object or system times that object or system's angular velocity. Now as far as units go on these, rotational inertia will be in kilogram meters squared, angular velocity will be in radians per second, and when we multiply those two together, the answer is gonna be in kilogram meters squared per second. Notice that the radians drops out there, radians being the, uh, the unitless unit, really just a ratio. Uh, sometimes those units will disappear and appear as necessary to make, uh, make our units just seem more sensible to us. And one more piece here. If we have a system that has no forces from outside the system that cause a torque on parts of the system or the system as a whole, then we can say that the angular momentum for that system before some event or at some initial moment in time will be equal to the angular momentum for the system at some later time or after some event. Uh, that is the total angular momentum. So angular momentum for individual objects within the system absolutely can change, but the total will remain constant unless we have an external torque. Now that we have that out of the way, let's look at a problem. In this problem, we have a person riding on a merry-go-round. That's a 60 kilogram person, a full-grown adult. Those things are dangerous. They're taking them out of all the playgrounds now. So we have an adult, somebody who probably isn't gonna get hurt on a merry-go-round, I suppose, riding on a 100 kilogram merry-go-round, which has a radius of two meters and an initial angular velocity of five radians per second clockwise. The person is at rest relative to the merry-go-round anyway. They're going around in circles relative to the ground. Um, and they're at the very outer edge of the merry-go-round. So they're standing right on the lip of the merry-go-round. That person is then going to move to the very center of the merry-go-round. So our mass is going to be redistributed as that person walks. And uh, because of that distrib redistribution of mass, we're also going to have a change in our value for I, the rotational inertia of our system, which corresponds then to a change of omega, the angular velocity of our system. So that's the question. How fast will this thing be rotating after the person gets to the very center of the merry-go-round? Let's start with a diagram, a, a graphical depiction of this situation. So in both the initial state and the final state, we have the same size wheel, still that two meters and 100 kilograms. Initially, we have the wheel spinning clockwise at five radians per second. And initially, this person is way at the very outer edge, so two meters away from that axis of rotation. In the final state, this person has walked inward. This thing is still rotating, but we would expect then it's rotating at some different angular velocity. So that's our task. How fast is it rotating once the person is right here in the middle? Well, in this case, we're not gonna have any external torques on the system. We'll assume that friction is uh, negligibly small, uh, as well as air resistance, and there aren't any other forces acting on it, so nobody's on the side of the merry-go-round pushing it to get it going faster or trying to slow it down. So just the merry-go-round and the person interacting with each other here, which means our system is going to have a constant value for the total angular momentum. So let's set up an equation to that effect. So that equation simply is the total angular momentum on the initial side or in the initial moment is equal to the total angular momentum in the final moment. Now we can break this up. We have two objects in our system and they each can have their own angular momenta. So let's break this up and just uh, have those two objects angular momenta added together on each side. I'll use the subscript MGR for merry-go-round and P for person. So all we're saying here is that the initial angular momentum of the merry-go-round plus the initial angular momentum of the person has to equal the total of those two at the end. So the final angular momentum of the merry-go-round plus the final angular momentum for the person. Angular momentum can be calculated as rotational inertia times angular velocity. So we can replace each L with an I times omega. So replacing each L term with I times omega gives us something like this. We have the initial 
uh, rotational inertia for the merry-go-round, which it turns out will actually not change, so we don't really need to specify that it's the initial value, but we've got it on the initial side and we might as well. Times the angular velocity for that merry-go-round initially, omega naught. Uh, that's not going to be different for the two objects, so I don't have any subscripts denoting merry-go-round versus person there. They'll both be, having, uh, be rotating at the same angular velocity. Plus the i for the person, uh, initial, and that one will actually change. The person moves, and so the rotational inertia caused by their mass will change times omega naught for them, the starting angular velocity, equals the ending angular, sorry, the ending rotational inertia for the merry-go-round times the ending angular velocity plus the ending rotational inertia for the person times the ending angular velocity. Now, those I terms are uh, all things that we can calculate values for. Um, let's do that separately, and then we can plug in. So the rotational inertia for the merry-go-round, like I said, is not going to change in this problem. That merry-go-round is going to behave like a solid cylinder. So we can look up an equation for the rotational inertia of a solid cylinder. And we find that that equation is I equals 1 half times M times R squared. So in this case, I is equal to 1 half times the mass of 100 kilograms times 2 meters squared, which is going to give us 200, there it goes, 200 kilogram meters squared. And just so I don't forget, that is I for the merry-go-round, uh, rotational inertia for the merry-go-round. That one won't change from uh, um, side to side, from initial to final. So let's go ahead and plug that in here. So we've got, whoops, 200 kilogram meters squared, and we've got 5 radians per second for the starting omega. Plus, okay, then the I for the person. Now that person is not going to behave like a solid cylinder rotating around its center. That person is uh, has a mass that's concentrated all at one spot on the circle, and that whole mass is moving all the way around in this circular path. That sounds like a uh, point mass, or a close approximation to a point mass anyway. Um, so we'll treat this person as though they are a point mass, which means we're going to use the equation I for the person this time is equal to mr squared, their mass times their distance from the axis of rotation squared. Now this one actually will change from initial side to final side. Initially they're two meters away from the axis of rotation, and on the final side they're right at that axis of rotation. So IP initial is going to be the person's mass, that's 60 kilograms, times the distance from the center, that'd be two meters, squared, and that's going to give us an initial rotational inertia of, let's see, that'd be 4 square meters times 60 is 240 kilogram meters squared. Now on the final side, this R value is going to be uh, very nearly zero. Now at, at this point, when the person gets to the axis of rotation, it probably doesn't make sense to treat them as a, a point mass anymore. And maybe like a cylinder uh, of, of its own uh, rotating around an axis there. Um, but it's going to have a very small radius. The person's dimensions are just very small compared to the, uh, um, the merry-go-round. So when it, let's go ahead and treat them like a point mass still. And that final value for IP then will be zero. It'd be 60 kilograms. And their distance from the axis of rotation is zero squared. Now, we might be able to get a slightly better approximation if we didn't treat them like a point mass here, but I don't think this is going to be too far off. So their final IP is just going to be zero. All right, now we can plug those values in here too. So we've got 240 kilogram meters squared times 5 radians per second. And that's equal to, now we're at the uh, I for the merry-go-round again. So that's uh, 200 kilogram meters squared times omega plus, and I for the person is zero. So zero times omega is just going to give us zero here. 
Now we have just a single unknown, that final value for omega. So let's go ahead and solve for that. So initially, that merry-go-round has 200 times 5, that'd be uh, 1,000 kilogram meters squared per second of angular momentum. And uh, that's going to be in the clockwise direction. Everything is here, so we can just make that the positive direction for everything and not have to worry about uh, negative signs on this. That person is going to have 240 times 5, so that'd be 1,200 kilogram meters squared per second of angular momentum. And then at the end, that person is not going to have that angular momentum anymore. We're treating them like a point mass. So we don't have any angular momentum from the person. We're just going to have the angular momentum for the merry-go-round. So just the 200 kilogram meters squared times that final value for omega. Now, in this problem, we must have uh, an initial angular momentum of 1,000 plus 1,200. That'd be 2,200 kilogram meters squared per second of angular momentum. And uh, at this point, that's going to all go to this uh, merry-go-round. Um, on the final point, that's all going to go to the merry-go-round, which has 200 kilogram meters squared of rotational inertia and an angular velocity omega. And if we divide both sides by 200, we find that we're going to end up with an omega here of 11. The units are going to be, well, kilogram meters squared per second divided by kilogram meters squared. The kilograms cancel, the meters squared cancel. We're just left with one over seconds. We're going to write it as radians over seconds, radians per second of angular velocity, and that would be in the clockwise direction still. All right, there we have it. Hey, thanks very much for sticking with us, folks. If you learned something from this video, I'd encourage you to like or subscribe so you can find future videos like this. Or uh, if you think of somebody who, uh, who might benefit from this, by all means, share this with them as well. Thanks again. We'll see you next time.